I'm Jerry Ostreicher. I'm a theoretical astrophysicist. I don't use telescopes very much. And I've been to Princeton for a very long time, also at Cambridge, also now at Columbia. Okay, and uh, how about just, how about, do you have any favorite music? Do I have any favorite music? Yeah, what do you listen to? Um, I guess I think I like Baroque best. Baroque, okay. Yeah. <laughs> any particular Baroque composer? Uh, Vivaldi, Telemann. Yeah. Vivaldi, Telemann, okay. How about hobbies? Photography. Photography. That's why I was admiring your camera. I see, okay. Do you have a still camera, video camera, or both? Um, I'm mainly still. Okay. Yeah. And uh, how about books? What are you reading now? The book I'm reading right now is nonfiction. It's by Bob Putnam, um, and it's called Our Kids. And he wrote Bowling Alone. He's a sociologist. Uh -huh. And I don't know, I got interested in this question of, of what makes America and what kind of people live here and why and where. And, and there are a few good books now. Favorite authors? Oh, my favorite authors easily. William Shakespeare. Oh, there's Shakespeare. Okay. There's, they're playing The Tempest here in, in Honolulu, and I feel like going tonight. I've, now I've heard that you are a uh, uh, very adamant player of squash. Absolutely. I, you know, I love squash. I play a couple of times a week. Really? And oh. my game is improving only with respect to one group, my age cohort. <laughs> yeah, By every other metric, it's getting worse and worse. <laughs> All right. Um, and when you're not thinking about Are We Alone, what do you think about? Um, well, right now, <coughs> excuse me, right now, I'm working on galaxy formation with Thorsten Knob and other people. I'm working on black holes, how to make them, what do they do. Um, it's a pretty exciting and open subject, and the relation between those two, because it turns out that they influence how galaxies evolve. Now, one question, I, I think I saw this on, uh, oh, on a, well, somebody said that the black hole is a singularity in space, and the black, Big Bang was a singularity in time. Uh, and, and I ran across this in the context of, do we live inside of a black hole? How crazy or non-crazy an idea is that? <sighs> <laughs> Where to begin? Where to Just begin? a second. Well, the simplest pictures of cosmology from Hubble before and after are we live in an infinite uniform medium universe. And so no matter where you were, it would always look the same at a given time. Black holes are not that way. They have a center. And you better watch out if you get too close to one. So they're topologically somewhat different, really. OK. And um, are we alone? I have been persuaded right from the beginning, from the Drake equation before and after that, that it's extremely unlikely that we're alone. And that this, it's just, it would be like somebody waking up in bed and saying, Am I the only human being in the universe? Well, even if there's nobody lying next to them in bed, it's just unlikely <laughs> that something as complicated as that could just suddenly arise. And then whatever made it arise wouldn't arise someplace else. You always have to think you're really exceptional. So there's no basis for it. Now there's a much better basis, as you know, and as your audience knows, the Drake equation took a whole lot of things that we don't know anything about and multiplied the, uh, the probabilities together and got an answer. So at some level, it was completely cuckoo. But the first few pieces of it, um, how many stars there are, we know that much better. How many stars have planets? 20 years ago, we didn't know that. Now we know, on average, stars have planets. And we even know now a bit about what kinds of planets. And, so, and we even know that there's, that there's some which are in the right temperature zone. So a lot of the things which were pure speculation early on are now you know, good science. Um, and my guess is we'll know the other parts of it over time. Um, but the whole issue is a lot more complicated than the naive ways people went about thinking about it at the beginning. 
And you may not like the, some of the things that I have to say on that. Oh, I, I'm fine. So let me just give you one example. Go. Let's assume that there is all kinds of life out there. Just take that as a starting assumption. So then the next question that Fermi asked was, where are they? Have they come to this planet? Um, before? Are they all around us? Are they sending signals to us? And it's almost embarrassing that we don't know about them if they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. Then you say, <coughs> let's think about it a little bit more. That's assuming that they'd be like us. Well, if we think about the other animals on the planet, some of them are a lot bigger than us, and some of them are a lot smaller than us, the bacteria, viruses. If there's life out there, it's probably extraordinarily various. And if there's intelligent life, just think about the kids in your high school class, how varied they were. Mm -hmm. Well, the ones in the universe are going to be more varied than that. And one Even of the things, in the high school class? <laughs> and one of the things is some of the people in your high school class were nice and friendly, and, uh -huh. and some of them were really nasty, and some of them were outgoing, and some of them were extremely shy. And so my guess is <clears throat> that the life in our galaxy will have the whole spectrum of characteristics that they could have. Now let's think of what that means. Suppose some of them are a little nasty. Well, OK, suppose a smaller fraction are really nasty and paranoid. Well, if they see life developing out there, those particular ones, and they may be only one in a billion. They say, you know, they have just gotten communications and radio, but it's not going to be too long before they've developed all kinds of high technology. And then they may be friendly or they may not be friendly. Let's zap them beforehand and knock them off. Well, let's suppose there are just a small number of such uh, critters in the galaxy. Well, if that's the case, then signals, when our signals get across the galaxy, whoever they are will have seen them. Well, we've had radio and TV and things like that for hundreds of years. We've had fires, which you probably can't tell from natural wildfires, um, for thousands of years. So at most, our signals have gone a few hundred miles light years away. But when they've gone 10,000 light years, we'd better watch out. And it may be that all of the nice civilizations have gotten wiped out by the, na the small number of nasties. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we don't see them is they were waving and saying, hi there, <laughs> have a nice day, until somebody went bang. And so it that's a solution to the Fermi paradox. And if it is this, that the reason why we don't see a lot is not that they weren't there, but that the small number of nasties killed them. If you look, and Hawaii is not a bad example, um, if you invite in some alien creatures who are more developed than you are, the odds are pretty good that they're going to be nasty to you. Um, the history on the planet is not very positive with regard to that. The, you know, when we complain about what the Chinese are doing to the Tibetans, we weren't too nice to the Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> they may not even, the extraterrestrials when they find us, may not even think we're good enough for their zoo. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> Especially if they're much more developed. Yes. So, then if that's the case, which kinds of people, creatures, I shouldn't say people, will survive? Well, let's suppose there's some that are very, very, very shy. They just live at the bottom of their oceans on their planets and just do nothing that can give any clue that they're there. Well, we're not going to notice them very easily either. So I once made some computer simulations with, with um, uh, undergraduates at Princeton. 
And so you make a whole variety of different kinds of civilizations from outgoing, friendly, nasty, all the different personality types that you can imagine. Mm -hmm. Well, at the end of the day, what you have is three kinds left. You have a very small number of really nasty SOPs uh -huh. Uh -huh. who just kill anything as soon as they see it move. You have a, very, a bunch of newbies, and those have been around a long time, those maybe even a billion years. Then you have a bunch of newbies who just created and said, hi there, we're having fun, are you out there? Do you want to talk to us? That's us. I <laughs> see. And then you have the really shy survivor types who are living under the oceans and who you'll never find out about. Okay, and so. that might be the world we live in. In which case, it would certainly pay for us to look for signals, but it would certainly not be smart to be sending out signals. If there are more than one of these uh, son of SOBs, then they will either fight each other and kill each other off, or they will get together and say, okay, let's form a club and not kill each other, agree to... In other words, cooperation is also part of Darwinism. Um, and that happens among warlords all the time. That's possible. They might just, since you can trace bullets of various kinds, they might just shoot and move. <laughs> <laughs> well, the European Union is going through such toothing <laughs> issues. So that's, uh, this is a kind of pessimistic scenario, but I don't think it's a mad one. Stephen Hawking suggested this at the launch of this uh, right. new effort. He he's, has said famously, we should keep our heads down. And I've talked to him about this. Uh -huh. yeah. And so you agree with him about that? I agree, or he agrees with me. I, I think agree. we agree. <laughs> okay. right, right. But I think it's worth thinking about, really. Huh. I thought about this way back when I knew Sagan, and uh, we were both in graduate school at the same time, the same place. Oh. And the so Chicago? these ideas of Carl Sagan, yeah. yeah Chicago, the, though. Yeah, yeah. Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, so these ideas have all been around, they're not new. Mm -hmm. And the Fermi paradox is an old one. So it, this whole, that whole tilt on things is, I think, an, an interesting one which is worth thinking hard about. Can you tell us a story about your time with Carl? Did you discuss anything of interest or did anything interesting happen when you were with him? Um, well, let's see, he got his PhD, I think, about a year before me in Chicago. So we overlapped slightly and talked about these things and many other things. I had written, I was working on um, planetary atmospheres to begin with. So I wrote the first paper saying Venus was hot. Oh. Um, Not in co-author with Sagan or anything. No, 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 but I was interested in planets at the time. We may turn into Venus if we keep on putting carbon <laughs> dioxide. Right. So you've had, I don't know, Going to, par <laughs> going to parties with Sagan or a coffee or? Um, we just met as students and not, not very, I don't I have good tales to tell. I see, you didn't like do homework together or anything? No, no. but we talked about uh, scientific issues, yeah. About are we alone? Yeah, we, we did talk about it. It's so far back. I think we're talking about 1964, so my memory isn't fantastic. Uh -huh. All right. There's one other topic, but maybe you want to ask me more questions, but there's one other topic in general which I thought about then and I still think about now. And that was, what's the best way to listen? Mm -hmm. um, and our first means of communication with each other, so out of earshot, was radio. And so we assumed that that was gonna be, the, that's the best way. But it's not at all obvious to me Radio signals do not propagate well in the galaxy. They don't go in straight lines, and um, they can be absorbed and distorted. So uh, we had no choice when we started thinking about it but to use radio. If I wanted to communicate, I'd use x-rays. I would use x-ray lasers. X-ray lasers. Because they go in straight lines, so I'm not wasting, filling the whole sky. Um, they go through anything. 
Um, so they're not stopped by interstellar dust. But they're stopped by atmosphere, aren't they? Um, high enough energy, they, they, they will get through. Oh. Or I guess if you're an inorganic alien, you're living not on a planet. But yeah. Uh, but, ex um, I mean, uh, high enough energy X-rays, gamma rays, can get, get, get through anything. Huh. If you remember the X-ray machines that used to look at your feet. Yes, yes, yes. Or, <laughs> or doctors to X-raying your bones that obviously can go through yes. a certain number of square centimeters, but much, much more than radio. That's the point. So if you were Yuri Miller and had a hundred million, well, if you had a hundred million dollars to donate to specific aspects of trying to answer the question, are we alone, you would dedicate some large fraction of that to X-ray observations? I, and I would look at LSST. For our audience, who, what's LSST? Um, large synoptic. Uh, I don't remember what the S, sec, I third think, S. I don't either. But yeah. Yeah, telescope. Yeah, telescope. So, and it's optical. But though, because right? that will have um, very good high time resolution. Because you'd probably want to send things pulsed. Micro, nano, milli. Well, it, the, the, it, the pulse length is a technical matter, what the right best pulse length is. Because if you make it too short, then the, then the more, and you've diluted it too much, there just won't be any photons in that pulse that'll get to somebody. Yes. <coughs> and when you go to higher, high enough energy, then the energy per photon is higher, but it means that a given energy output you produce fewer photons, uh -huh. so you need somewhat longer pulses. So the, the amount of information per watt is, is worse? You do fine, you no. Do you do fine because you gain in a lot of other ways. You have a much narrower beam. I see. How about neutrinos? I think that would be an interesting one because the neutrino detectors might be good. So I would basically not make too many bats. In other words, and saying, I think I know which haystack to look under. And so I would definitely do radio, but you want to have good time resolution. So I would try to buy time on any of the instruments which has high time resolution, mm -hmm. and then look for time varying signals which are quote unquote unnatural. The current X-ray obser observatories that we have, what's their time resolution? Do you know? Seconds I, or tens of seconds? I, I don't know enough to know give you a quantitative answer. Well, let, but I think it's quite good. Okay. Let's suppose Because they look at pulsars and things. They uh -huh. look at X ray pulsars. Yeah, so milliseconds and Yeah. So let's suppose that neutrino communication is the uh, standard, the lingua franca of the universe. Um, so what would be the best way or the most efficient way for an advanced extraterrestrial civilization to emit and to receive Well, that's neutrinos. the point. We can't do it now. I know we can't, but let's, let's give us a billion dollars in a million years. But what would can, they look like? Okay, but right now, we absolutely don't know how to send or receive neutrino signals. Right. So what you have to do... We know do, a little bit. We know we have these uh, super yeah. chemical candy and... Yeah, but it, it's so insensitive. Yes. So, so that's why I was picking... Um, I was going in that direction to take something that's more penetrating, yes, but something where we do have good technology now, mm -hmm. and we have satellites working. So I would do radio the way they're doing it, huh? but I would also do optical. Um, I would do infrared. James Webb will have, be excellent for that. Um, time resolution on the infrared? It'll have good time resolution. When you say good, you mean? I don't know don't, the details. Okay. I don't want to press where okay. and guess wrong. Right, right, right. But infrared travels further and is less stopped by dust. Yes. So, um, so I would basically piggyback on all of the experiments around, uh, not knowing what, what they might use, and just look for any um, time-varying signals, okay. which are quote-unquote unnatural. All right, so that's electromagnetic spectrum. But again, these neutrinos, can you just speculate a little bit about what you could imagine would be the best neutrino detector system? I don't know enough particle physics okay. to be able to tell you 
what would work. <laughs> All right. So, so no one else can do it. No one else can either. That's right. Okay, good. <coughs> um, so you mentioned in our conversation earlier that uh, you it, the people in, who are looking at radio and optical may be looking under the wrong haystack. Can, what, so what other, you, you mentioned the x-ray haystack and I guess the neutrino haystack. Are there any other haystacks that we should talk well, about? Well, I would look at optical too. Optical. Um, the fact that stars radiate in the optical, that explains why our eyes are sensi sensitive in the optical, mm -hmm. because the sun is a star. But that might be a clue. Um, there might be a whole lot of reasons why uh, they might want to use optical. And the point that Martin Recent and others have made is if you were to, um, let's say, approach the English shore in the 18th century, uh, what would you have seen? You would have seen beacons. Mm -hmm. And um, we have satellites which we use for communication and for um, uh, GPS, for placement. So what you may have out there are essentially beacons, which, which they're using for uh, navigation, not for communication, uh -huh. um, as we do. Uh -huh. yes, yes, yes. And so that's, that would be another, so you'd ask. And again, pulse signals are good for that. All right, how about gravity waves? Well again, the detection is so poor on those. LIGO is a joke. Oh, okay, right, <laughs> because it's, it's not very sensitive. It's just so incredibly insensitive. There's always been a current LIGO and the next generation LIGO and an advanced LIGO. Uh -huh. And in 20 years, it's going to work and detect something. Right, but what and about that's always been the case and probably always will. But wait a minute. Let's, let's, say, we, <coughs> let's say we don't kill ourselves in, in yeah. 10,000 years or even 10 million years. Presumably, we will, have much, we will be much better at detecting gravitational waves. And the question is, would that be a good way to, for advanced civilizations of arbitrary advancement? Well, to, one advantage is that they go through everything. Mm, yes. Um, they probably go straight to, or I guess they, they go geodesics, I guess. Yeah, they, they follow geodesics. Um, right now, all the sources that we can think of emit, so to speak, over the whole sky. They don't tend to, some of them tend to emit beamed uh, radiation. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it's not easy to beam them. And if you can't, you're wasting a whole lot of energy. Unless you want to beacon. Yes, yes. Then you yes. want to fill the whole sky. Yes. All right. Now, if... if I'd almost like to get back a little bit before we finish uh -huh. to my original gloomy... Um, if you say that that's right, and think that there might be some nasties out there. Um, whoever they are, they would think time is of the essence because they wouldn't want to take a chance that you would develop and do something to them. So however they decided to go after you, they would try to do it in the speediest possible manner. Because if you detect them, you might be nasty and try to go after them, etc. That's the way paranoids are. Yeah. <laughs> well, is that paranoia or is that re reasonable fear? You can paranoia is is it's reasonable fear. <coughs> um, it's an extreme of a certain kind of reason is the way of thinking about it. But then you have to ask, well, what would they do? And is this something we should watch out for? Okay. Mm -hmm. And I spent a bit of time thinking about that. And it's not easy to think of what they would do. 
because if you imagine, you know, sending suitcase bombs, well, it would take a long time for them to get from them to us. Yes. Um, and I haven't been able to think of a way that they could, let's say, shoot at our sun and make our sun explode and therefore wipe us out. Um, it would be clever if you could do that. That's what the uh, doomsday machine and Dr. Strangelove was going to do, I think. Or yes. <laughs> so then you say, well, how would they do it? Um, probably the best means would be, you know what Jonestown was like. Yes. Um, there was a cult, and the crazies in charge convinced everyone to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. Well, intelligent creatures have imagination, and imagination can be manipulated, otherwise advertising wouldn't be so successful, and religions wouldn't be so successful. And so what you'd want to do is goad them into murdering themselves. Kind of like alien versions of Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> Right. <laughs> or suicide bombers, right? Exactly. Okay. So, so then you'd say, oh, okay, how would you do that? Because that you can do at the speed of light. Uh, okay. Okay? So, it's not like blowing them up, you just do it at the speed of light. So you're doing it with marketing. You don't need armaments, you just need marketing. Right. So what you would do is listen to their radio broadcasts and their entertainment things, and then just craft the right message well, in the movie Contact, I think yeah. some of the military types sub suspected that about the message that Jodie Foster Air Lee Car Haraway had uh, received. She said, how do we know that this is not a machine that's going to kill us when we build it? Well, that's where I'm going. I know, I know. I hear, I hear that. That's where I'm going. So if you follow that track, that would certainly be the most efficient means that you can think of. Um, you can think of all kinds of things wrong with it because everyone's is culture bound and you might you know get the white northerners but not the dark southerners so if you follow that track and i don't know how plausible you think it is but it doesn't seem to me implausible <laughs> you have to be quite careful about what you're sending out but you also should be a little careful about your listening oh how's that oh that's right because that's right okay because so Stephen Hawking hasn't said anything about being, <coughs> being paranoid about listening. He, exactly. I see. But it makes just as much sense to I be see. extremely careful about listening. I see. Or rather, where, after you listen, be careful what you do with the message, I guess. The, exactly. Huh. Okay. So if you, <laughs> let's suppose that you were in charge of SETI and you had received a message would you then keep it secret because you would wanted to investigate its properties with respect to this danger? I, I, it's a very fair question. Um, so let's take another field. This CRISPR technology. Hmm. Um, it's almost at the level where somebody in a garage can take a bit of blood from somebody who has measles and take the measles virus. Wait a second, I'm gonna to have to stop you because this card I put in is not doing its job because the memory, this recording speed is not up to snuff. And so I'm gonna try some, another one here. And I don't know what I'm doing with so many of these things, but there we go. How about that one? That, yeah, okay, there we go. Now back on deal, back online. Sorry. Um, so, on technology developments and some of the spooky aspects of it, the CRISPR technology is, is just about at the level where somebody could find someone who has measles, take some of their blood, get the vaccine out, get the virus out, go to the specific piece of the DNA which makes them, which affects their immune system in a way that the vaccine can stop them from propagating, cut out that piece. So now the vaccine doesn't work. Yes. Huh. Now put it back and 
you would kill 5% of the planet before they had a new vaccine. Mm -hmm. And this could be done tomorrow. So suppose you know that technology. Um, do you want to write a paper and put it in nature and let anybody do it? See, it's not like nuclear weapons where you have to have thousands of centrifuges running for a long time. Um, so something like that, um, there was a huge debate whether the technology should be published because it's it really easy to use in devastating ways. I've even forgotten how it finally was concluded, but I think it was published. Um, but it is different from nuclear weapons because it's, it's so much cheaper. Well, in a similar way, if I got interesting messages from such and such, and I was worried about them, if I told people, everybody would be tuning in. <laughs> well, you can always say, oh, well, too bad for you guys. Uh, you know, you're... Well, in, in some sense, you're talking about religion. And so, you know, exactly. The ability to self-sacrifice. And usually that's done because you believe in a higher power. So you're telling us that the aliens might be able to convince a large fraction or possibly all of humanity that there is a higher power, i.e. the alien, who you should die for. Kill all the people who don't believe in us and then... Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, that's a new level of fear that I hadn't encountered in, elsewhere. <laughs> but at any rate, once you start thinking about these things and give them much more wit than we have, we, you know, I was just in the Hawaiian Museum. And the Bishop Museum? The, the, Bishop. Yeah, the Bishop Museum. Uh -huh. And they spent an awful lot of their efforts on warfare and weapons. Yes. Like the Maori, I think yeah. like most Polynesians, yeah. And many societies do. Yes, yes. America. And so if we want to think that the intelligent uh, species out there don't do this, mm -hmm. it's a happy guess, but it seems to me awfully unlikely. Well, if you get too destructive, then you, then the the tribes around you uh, that are not quite as nasty you can get together and fight you. And just because you're nasty doesn't mean you'll be the most well-equipped, right? Well, you've probably seen the, the um, discussions about human population. Why have we just now filled up the planet with people when if the birth rate and death rates were what they are now, we, we could easily have done this a long time before. Uh -huh. so what's the answer and one of the major regions is warfare. It kept the population densities down. And I guess you've read Steven Pinker's new book about this, the, Our Inner Angels or something. Well, he's talking about how, how the reduction in warfare yes. in recent years has, has gone along with a gigantic increase in the population. So, again, the explanation for why, they, why space is not teeming with aliens may be the same reason the population in the universe, it, it, the population oh, the universe is low. Maybe the same, that you only have the recently developing ones. Oh, I see. So, the, the, so it's the same argument the, as so, the Pinker argument. So let me get this straight. So the, now the human population was very, very low until fairly recently. And, and it was and warfare that kept it warfare, down. Tribal warfare that kept it down. And then there's, so if we look around the Fermi paradox, one solution is the population of intelligent species is very low. That's because there's so much warfare out there. Exactly, that, that, that intelligent systems keep on uh, being born, but warfare keeps the numbers way down. Well, how about the Galactic Club, the uh, UN, the Galactic, <laughs> the Galactic equivalent of the UN? Aren't, they, aren't there UN peacekeepers in the galaxy? It's a fair question. <laughs> um, at least in the past, it hasn't been stable. Maybe <clears throat> we're getting <clears throat> to the point on this planet where we see we're all in the same boat. But it's not obvious that everybody would have seen the galaxy as all being in the same boat. Okay, all right. I mean, it could happen. Mm -hmm. But I think the only reason now is I really do think those pictures 
from the 60s of seeing the earth from afar mm -hmm. and the realization, hey, we've, and that led to the ecological movement as well. Yes. And the environmental movement. So I think these, the realization that we're on this, all on the spaceship together has been good in reducing warfare as well as in birth of environmental consciousness. So similarly, if we really do a great job of looking everywhere for aliens and find none, the idea that we are probably alone is, will provide an analogous stimulus that, that that picture of the Earth did, that we are alone. What are we going to do about it? Maybe it'll inspire some more, I don't know, peaceful activities on Earth and keep us from killing ourselves? Or It could, uh, but it might inspire us with paranoia. <laughs> <laughs> We're only alone because the, because the space is filled with enemies. Um, so I want to bring back something we talked about on the way here. There is this very curious fact that if you draw a line from, let's say, when, when in the age of the universe you could have life mm -hmm. to now, mm -hmm. and then say, when will we born intelligent life. It's right at the very end. Mm -hmm. It's at the very end. And we could have been born anywhere along that line. And if there are others like us, they could have been. So no one thinks that all the life in the universe just started mm -hmm. um, a thousand years or so intelligent life just started, or a hundred thousand years from now. That would be mad. Well, once you say that, well, it's probably been at a constant level, whatever the level is, for some time, then the, the Fermi paradox gets much worse. Because they could travel across the whole galaxy, they could be communicated. Yeah. There's ample time, and then it becomes very suspicious. Um, maybe we're only around now because they haven't seen us yet. I see. All right. All right. All right. Okay. That's an interesting ideas you have there. So let's let me ask you again yeah. the question: Are we alone? So, um, I think it would be amazing if we were. <coughs> um, but the other we out there may be very, very different from us. Mm -hmm. They may be, they'll be the survivors. And then the different reasons why people might, cre creatures might survive, and they're at the two ends of the spectrum. They might survive because they're really, really, really quiet. <laughs> or they might survive because they're really, really noisy and last nasty. <laughs> right, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, that, well thank I, you. I think that's good. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much for all of that. And we so, had fun. We did. I'm going to be uh, putting, editing this, putting it, some fraction of it on. One the, thing I wonder about is whether there'll be math signals. In other words, whether they'll be sending us pi. Or Baroque music signals. Like, yes. You know, so, so there's a little bit of debate in the community about whether what would be best, music or math. And based on the tr attempts that have so far been made to Across the species barrier on Earth, music is winning hands down. <laughs> Seriously, they've, they've, you know, they're going out and play with, you know, teaching math to dolphins doesn't seem to work nearly as well as amusing <laughs> them with flutes. Oh, so well, that is interesting. Yeah, I, th I think that is. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, this was fun. Good, good. I'm glad you had a good.